Today's a very special day, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you're here. We may not always recognize it as a special day, but uh, today is the baptism of the Lord Sunday. And uh, I think it's a special day. I think it's a tremendous day because it gives the congregation an opportunity to consider our need for baptism. What is it anyway? Why is it important for many of us? Why did we get baptized? The question, why did Jesus get baptized? So many questions that could come to mind as we think about baptism. Often we don't think much about it, but it's very important. It's a pivotal part of our faith and, and uh, what it is to be a Christian. And so I'm trying, going to try to answer most of these questions today. Uh, hopefully... I'll get most of them in, but what makes this a special day uh, for me, and hopefully for you, is that at the end of the service, we're going to have a special ritual, a special kind of uh, opportunity to remember your baptism, or to reclaim your baptism, to remember what was done, to recovenant ourselves to the commitments that we made, recognizing, hopefully, how our baptism uh, changed us and shaped us. And helped us to become the people that God wants us to be. And for those that haven't been baptized, they can perhaps consider uh, what it is to be baptized and why they would need or want something like that. So hopefully at the end of the service, we will all be motivated then to live out our baptism in new and exciting ways. Because that is what baptism signifies. Something new. Baptism is all about starting over. Baptism is about a new beginning changing from what we used to be to what we will be, what we can be through Jesus Christ. We use water, of course, to symbolize both washing and to symbolize burial. And our baptism liturgy, as Romans tells us, uh, indicates that we're not just being made clean through the washing, but we're being uh, born again, or declaring that we're born again, dead to self, Alive to Christ. Romans talks about that, but we'll see that in a little bit. First, we get to look at the scripture to see where the story is told about Jesus' baptism. We mentioned last week that very little is, is mentioned about Jesus' childhood. We know that they talk about his birth and a couple stories here and there about some people showing up with some gifts. We talked about last week. There's a story about him showing up at the temple when he's 12, but we're not going to talk about that today. But then the next real major thing that happens is Jesus' baptism, and he's 30 years old now. So we don't really get into too much. And, and uh, I want to just uh, speak briefly for what that is. Because from here on in, basically, uh, from here to Easter, we get to begin focusing on Jesus' ministry. We might talk about his birth, we talk about just a brief thing about his childhood, but then we really want to get into an earnest understanding of who Jesus is. And so that's why our, our calendar, our Christian calendar, says right after we talk about Epiphany, let's talk about his baptism, and then work our way to the cross and to the resurrection. Now, I'm not going to do a, a, a sermon series based on that, because I like to do things different, so I'm not going to tell you what our sermon series is going to be yet. You have to find out next week. See that? See what I did there? Yeah. It's going to be good, though. Man, you're going to like it. Okay. So, um, anyway. So, with that, so, we begin the year after Epiphany with the baptism, because baptism is when Jesus' ministry starts. That's when it all gets started. And, and so, we can see the story in Matthew chapter 3. And the story begins in verse 1 by talking about John the Baptist. It says, In those days... John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea. Now, I'm not going to read all Matthew 3, 1 through 10, that talks about John the Baptist and his ministry, because we know the story of John the Baptist, and, and we're not focusing on all of his ministry today. We just simply want to mention briefly, you know, he was the first prophet to appear in Israel since the time of Malachi. He was prophesied as the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who would prepare the Lord who would make straight the path for the Messiah. He, he came in a curious way. Interestingly, I mean, he was preaching in the desert, it said, in the wilderness, in the desert of Judea. He didn't go to the cities where all the people were. He went out in the middle of nowhere. And what's curious about that is he came to preach to God's people, but he didn't go to God's people. He came to God's area, and the Jews would go for him because they heard 
this guy saying some interesting stuff, and, and they wanted to find out what was going on. So they would go out to Jordan to, to him. And he was down at the Jordan in the wilderness because that's where he needed to do his work. Because his work was about baptizing. He couldn't really do it. Couldn't baptize in the Jordan River in Jerusalem because the Jordan River didn't run through Jerusalem. You know, he didn't just, okay, okay. So he was down to Jordan, and they would come. But he, the message that he preached was really strange, perhaps, and curious to many, because he was telling God's people, the Jews, that they needed to fix the relationship with God. His message was repent and be baptized. Repent, of course, is not the idea. You need to change something. You need to turn it off. That you're going one way, and you need to go another way. Because it was really doing the best. But he was telling God's people, get this, he was telling God's people, you're not right. You need to change something. Now, I think some of us would be offended by that. What do you mean I'm not right? What do you mean I'm not change something? I'm part of God's chosen people. The Jews, of course, have been God's chosen people. The Bible talks about that. God chose them apart from all the nations. He made a covenant with the ancestors, with, with first with Noah, or first with you know, Noah, Abraham, David. He made a covenant with them. They have been God's people. But John the Baptist is saying, if you really want to get right with God, you can repent and be baptized. Now, baptism was a way, even. For the Jewish culture, it was a ceremonial washing that they did for proselytes, people who were converted to Judaism, and even so, they really couldn't be a full-fledged Jew because that was a uh, ancestry thing. But they could become closer. But now they to get right in a certain way to say that we want to be changed and, and be a part of this community. And so he was basically saying to all the Jews, "You need to get changed to be part." Of God's family. Now, a lot of Jews were kind of good with that because they recognized, yeah, we're not really doing what God says. They were, uh, you know, they, they, we haven't really lived up to our commitment. Remember, time and time again, the Old Testament, uh, you know, Joshua said, Choose ye this day whom you'll serve. You know, in, in a, many times, the, the, the priests and the prophets, the kings would say, You know, if you follow God's commands, you'll be blessed. If you don't, you're going to be cursed and all these things. So there was a commandment that was always to follow God's command. But the people who had kind of forgotten about it and just thought, well, my family was Jewish. You know, my, my ancestors, I served the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I must be good. And just like, just because your ancestors knew God doesn't mean you know God. Well, that's a hard thing to hear, isn't it? And sometimes it's even so for Christians. Oh. Just because our grandparents and our parents know God doesn't mean we know God. Amen. We have to have time to make that confession where we have to sign a Bible up for ourselves. You know, so many times people grow up in church and they come to church because their parents brought them to church, because their grandparents brought them to church, but they don't really have any commitment or connection to God. But they, Come because you're supposed to. First off, if that's you, I'm glad you're here because you are supposed to be here. But it's more than just because your ancestors, because your parents or your grandparents. It's because you want to be living and obedient and blessed by God. So as John gave this message to begin anew, to repent of all they've done and how they've forsaken God, he called them to admit that they were sinners and that they needed to repent and start over. And people get this. People flooded to John. Crowds would come. Like, yeah, we do that to over. Yeah, uh, our relationship with God is jacked up. We're, we're not really good. We need to get this fixed. Sure. we come. And so they did. And John baptized him. And uh, it was quite radical. Um, uh, because for, especially radical for the religious leaders. Even some of the religious leaders would come. But they didn't come. They came to find out what's going on out there. Why are these people going out in the wilderness to the Jordan River? Because they didn't really think they needed to change. They'd go and see what was going on. A couple of them would go and say, Oh, yeah, John, I will let you baptize us. And John's like, uh, No, I'm not going to baptize you because you don't even understand what it means yet. He said, You know, you need to bring forth 
fruit of repentance. Show me that you're willing to change. Show me that you really mean it. And they'd walk away kind of mad. Because for the religious leaders, religion was offerings and incense. It was rules and conduct. But religion is, is more than just uh, transactions and transference. Religion is relationship and renewal. And that's what John was trying to give. And he says, if you want to get right with God, then submit to baptism, recognizing that you need to start over. Ready to live a new life for God. But John could only do so much, and he freely admitted it. Many would come, the religious leaders would come, he'd send them away. But then he admitted from the beginning that he was not the end of the situation. He was not the story. He was just the beginning of the relationship with God. And he said right in the beginning, you see this in chapter 3, verse 11, he says, I don't bet that he was one for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He said, I don't know if it's time. You come to me because you want to get your relationship right with God and start with it. That's great. But this is not all it happens. Because there's one coming up to me who's more powerful than me. I can't even carry his jokes, he said. Well, sandals, but you know. He knew that he was just the forerunner of the one who would come after him. That's Jesus. And with all the actions he received, with all the crowds that followed him with the disciples that John the Baptist had, he always admitted he was not worthy of anywhere close to who Jesus was. Because his baptism of water was nothing compared to the baptism yet to come. Nothing compared to the baptism that Jesus would bring. A baptism of the Holy Spirit and the fire. And they knew what the Holy Spirit was. The Holy Spirit was there. He said, He's going to come and baptize you with God Himself. The Spirit of God will come upon you. And it will burn. It will burn within you. It will change you. And he goes on to talk about it. But see, think about the opposites. John's baptism with water, kind of benign. Jesus baptizing with fire. That's not really benign, is it? No. Like, Here's a nice little calm. Water baptism. Jesus is going to come and set you aflame. Hallelujah. So often we get the water baptism, we just become nice and calm Christians. But Jesus wants us to be aflame. He wants us to be active, vibrant, excited about our faith because the change is so dramatic. Fire and the Holy Spirit. Of course, before the fire and the Holy Spirit can come, the flesh has to be washed. We have to admit our need to start anew. Only then can the fire and Holy Spirit baptism come. So John speaks of this as power, refining, and life-changing. As he says in verse 12, as it talks about this baptism, he says, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, gathering the wheat into the barn, and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. See, the baptism of Jesus is more than just a friendly little washing. The baptism of Jesus, when he comes, he's cleaning house. That's what he's doing. When you separate the wheat from the chaff, you're like, the good stuff, we're going to store it up. The bad stuff, we're going to go get burned. We're going to throw it away because it's no good. So when the Holy Spirit comes, once you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come and begin to start changing you from the inside out. It's going to change you. It's going to, it's going to help you to make good and right decisions. It's going to help you to get rid of stuff that's no good. It's just going to burn it up. And all that's going to remain is that good, wholesome wheat, the seeds that will be life-giving, that will help others. This is what the example that John's giving, the metaphor that he's giving. This is no joke. This is serious stuff he's talking about. Serious change. Serious transformation. John says, if this water baptism is concerning to you, just wait till you see what happens when the one who comes after me shows up. You ain't seen nothing yet. So if the water 
baptism is really nothing compared to the baptism that Jesus brings. Here's the big question. Uh, why is the water baptism important at all? I mean, why do we do the water baptism if that's not the one that really matters? Baptism by water, isn't that just John's baptism, the starting point? We want Jesus' baptism, don't we? I mean, the answer was supposed to be yes. I was, yes, yes. We want Jesus' baptism. Yes. So, why is this baptism important at all? Well, hold that thought. We're going to get to it in a minute, I hope. Verse 13. Because we see what happens next. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Verse 14. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? See, Jesus shows up. And John both had the same questions that we have. You know, this baptism is nothing compared to your, you know, I need your baptism, Jesus. I mean, I need to be baptized by you. He says, you know, uh, I don't know what I'm going to offer you, Jesus, because the real life transforming baptism is not in the water of the water. That's just the admitting that I need change. That's what the water does. But the change comes through the Holy Spirit. So Jesus Christ, we can't change on our own. We can try, but you know what happens when we try? We fail. If we really want to change, we need the Holy Spirit to change. We need the fire from, from somewhere else. The fire of the Holy Spirit. Because we can change all we want. That's just our that's just our human ability. We need God's ability to truly change. So John's like I, why do you come to be baptized by me? I'll be baptized by you. It's the baptism of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the transformation. That's what is really important. John's baptism, after all, a baptism for repentance, right? Repent and be baptized. He said, Jesus, you don't need to repent of anything. I mean, repentance is for those who have sinned. It's for, I don't know, people like you and me. Just going to say it. People who sin. But Jesus, but that's not him. He doesn't fit into that category. Yes, he was fully human, but sin, no, he never did that. Never did he sin. So he had no sin to repent from. He didn't have the opportunity to, to say, I need to get my life to break the faith. Because it was the only thing with God. He didn't have the they have to say, well, let me just start a meal because I don't think, you know, I, I mean, I got some of this stuff washed away. He didn't have anything to be washed away. John's like, I, I don't know what I can do for you, Jesus. You can do something for me because I want that whole stuff, but I got nothing for you. John had turned out of the way from baptism, like I said, the Pharisees, because they weren't ready for baptism. But here he tried to turn Jesus away because they didn't need the baptism. Or so John thought. But Jesus has other ideas, and he shows us the value and importance of the water baptism. Jesus replied in verse 15, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. You see, Jesus knew that God had been called by God for this purpose. And he needed to witness to our to Jerusalem, to, to everybody who was there, that John was doing the proper things. He needed to validate John's ministry, that this baptism that he was doing was of God, that it wasn't just some strange guy with, uh, you know, camel's hair and locusts and honey out in the wilderness, who was just dunking people in water. It was not like that. This was something that God or God, he would do to get everybody ready for what Jesus was doing. So he was kind of telling the whole nation what John's doing is right. It's important. So much so that I submit to it. So in submitting to baptism, he authenticated John's ministry. Likewise, 
He demonstrated for his followers, kind of like for us, in his humiliation, the need to submit to baptism by water. He demonstrated to us the importance. I mean, we, we said we want to follow Jesus, right? If we're following Jesus, the first thing we need to do is follow Jesus into baptism. That's why baptism is the first steps in our church membership, because that's where it starts. That's where the ministry starts. That's where nothing that did for the cause of Christ, or for the cause of God, was established until he submitted to baptism. Not that he knew it, for his ability to do the work, but for everyone to recognize this is the inauguration of God's plan. This is where it begins. So baptism was so pivotal, and his baptism by John was so important. It's the first step for us to see the path we have to follow. As we know, Jesus is the way. And if we follow the way, we begin by following with the baptism. We know that Jesus knew what he was doing, right? Jesus didn't just do this haphazard. So he knew that this was an important step. He knew that he needed to be baptized, not for his sake, but for our sake, so that we could understand the importance. We can understand the significance of what we're doing. And so he, so John consented and baptized Jesus. See, baptism by God is the first step for us in professing our faith in Jesus, especially for those who are baptized as infants. They don't even get to make a statement. But we covenant with God and each other. We want this child to be set apart, to be asked to God to do something. In the child, we baptize as infants, we're saying, we have a community of faith. We want God to be active. So we set this child apart, baptizing them. And then they have the time that they make that faith for themselves through confirmation. When they say, well, my parents or my sponsors did for me at baptism, I claim for myself. And if they hadn't been baptized, they would choose then to be baptized. That's what that whole process is. But for us who weren't baptized, like that, then, then we would get to the point where we say, I believe in Jesus so much to the point that I want to follow him in baptism. That's the first step. I understand what he did. I want to, to know the Holy Lord. I want to follow the path. I want to do what he wants. I want to repent of my sins and be changed. I want to start over. It's the initiation into the church. The first step in being a part of the family of God, the body of Christ. That's why we need baptism. Because we all have at some point to start over. We must take the first step before we can take any other. We can't hit the finish line before we have the starting line. That's why we need baptism. That's where it starts. Jesus' ministry began with his submission to baptism. And then he was off and running. Bam. As you read the Gospels, you see, once, once he got baptized, then spiritual warfare started, then his ministry started, all kinds of things started once he submitted to baptism. Submitting to baptism is submitting to God's will. We see what happened as soon as the baptism was complete, how this was blessed by God, how God truly feels about this event in verse 16 and 17. It says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, as soon as he was baptized, immediately he went up out of the water, just that month, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God ascending like a dove and riding on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Did Jesus need to be baptized for repentance? No. But when he was baptized, he let all the world know that God said, I'm pleased with this. Let me tell you who this boy is. This man at that point, right, 30 years old. This is my son whom I love. But see, the Holy Spirit said, Let's go 
the pictures are always stuck at the ground because they really can't. I mean, the Holy Spirit, you have to God say, oh, the Holy Spirit, that's not quite the whole thing. It's just a, a metaphor for us to understand what it would look like. Uh, but once you submitted the baptism, the whole crowd witnessed God's declaration. Well, Jesus validated John's ministry. The voice of God validated Jesus's. In these two verses, we see the Trinity as the Holy Spirit shows up. The voice of the Father from heaven declares that Jesus is the Son. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Back right now to begin the gospel. This is a Trinity moment. This is a holy moment. It's not some passing ritual, not some just weird washing. It's a declaration of affirmation. God is pleased with this and pleased with Jesus and pleased that Jesus was beginning this ministry where it all started at the waters of baptism. That's why we need baptism. We need to begin the way Jesus began by being baptized. For us, it is a cleansing. We recognize we need repentance. <laughs> Maybe just me, but okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. But it's also a commitment and a testimony of our faith in Jesus. And our faith in Jesus will lead us to the second baptism. That may happen at the same time as we see the Holy Spirit coming down on Jesus, so the Holy Spirit will baptize us, perhaps. When we submit to baptism, maybe at that moment the Holy Spirit will come. I kind of believe that sometimes the Holy Spirit will come before we do the, the public confession with the, with the water. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we say we need Jesus and we start to start out the water, begin again, then Jesus will do his thing. The Holy Spirit will come in and start cleaning us up. And we need to submit to water baptism and declare for everyone. You know, in some cultures around the world, uh, baptism is a huge deal. Especially in Africa and Asia, where it's illegal to become a Christian. Baptism is a public deal. People stand up in face of the only opposition and declare to their community, I am following Jesus. It's a big deal. We kind of because our nation is so much indoctrinated with Christianity, we kind of don't think of it as a big deal. Oh, it's a nice little thing. But it's huge to say, I'm running with Jesus. So I know many of you have already done this. Maybe, maybe all of you have already been baptized. You're like, Pastor, you're going on and on about something that you know, we did a long time ago. Hallelujah. You know what I'm going to this message to, to say to you? But today I want you to remember... What happened at your baptism? I want you to remember what God was doing, what God was saying, and what God continues to do today. Because you've been baptized well, hopefully you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and God is continuing to change you unless you've already reached perfection. Anybody? No. Close. Close, thank you. <laughs> I can't I got it. So the third part of baptism, a fall. So I want you to remember today that God is still working. The Holy Spirit is still working. Chaff is still being burned up. Commitments are still being made. Remember what Jesus did for you and be thankful. For those of there's any here who have never been baptized, I want to encourage you today to consider your need, to consider working with Jesus, to consider making a commitment to change your life, to let Jesus baptize you with the Holy Spirit and the fire. And then if you've never been baptized after the service, I'd like you to talk with me about it. Not working to anything, but I think it's something we need to talk about. Because I don't want you to miss out on all that God has for you. I don't want you to miss out on your best life possible. And that begins as we submit to baptism. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your example. We thank you for your baptism. We thank you that we can see and understand our need to start fresh, to start anew, to, to be cleansed from our old self and to be changed into what the Holy Spirit will make us to be, the persons you created us to be. We pray that you would be with each one here that as we consider our baptism, remember the commitments and covenants made, to begin again, recommit ourselves to follow you each and every day, to let the baptism that we have done before still inform and shape us today. 
If there's some who haven't accepted that baptism, haven't chosen to follow you, that today would be the day that they could start the year anew and afresh, starting off following you. Let this be the year where they follow the, right, the way of Jesus Christ. Their life becomes changed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.